Hello everyone, today we talk about the 11th century Byzantine cataphracts equipment. I'm coming back on this topic after having made a video uh, on the so-called Nikephorian cataphracts, so these Byzantine cataphracts existing uh, at least documented between the, 12th, uh, the 10th and 12th century. Um, uh, and I thought um, to to add something to this, not much because of an extremely, you know, um, expertise on this topic at all, because I I relatively come without, uh, at least we're, we have very few notions about um, uh, Byzantine cataphracts equipment, but uh, trying to, to add a bit of concepts uh, relatively to the um, essentially, for, for be um, be aware um, of um, and to, let's say to avoid categorizations, because I feel that when we study um, ancient military history, um, essentially up to the industrial age, we have this um, kind of war gameistic. Um, mindset for which everything has to fit into a category, everything has to be, mm, in a certain sense, scientifically classified on the base of certain characteristics and all. And this comes from the, uh, the necessity that we have grown um, to undoubtedly uh, put um, a certain stake uh, um, somewhere. It, it's something we do all the time in history. Um, by you know periodizing by um, defining you know the, the same title here it's essentially Byzantine cataphracts so you understand that we could open a huge parenthesis only on the concept of, of Byzantine that is actually is not a correct term at all as most of you probably already know if you're watching a Byzantine history um, uh, Byzantine history video. Um, but uh, when it comes to, to, to equipment, military history, we are tempted to do this um, increasingly and um, for in essentially for the lack of uh, evidence. And the lack of evidence is quite uh, dangerous, not only for the direct um, uh, e evidence of absence, um, or better, uh, absence of e evidence, but because the the this absence of evidence brings us to reason as if there was an evidence of absence, um, for which we have to concentrate fully, exclusively on the material datum and uh, basically shut in uh, your brain <laughs> your brain for any other logical consideration. Uh, unfortunately, when we um, look at these mm, spaces and times in history, because um, you know it's not unfortunately that every place is documented in the same way during history, um, and, and there is not even a progressive time, um, uh, you know, uh, progressive knowledge that that goes on according with the chronological order and times. There are moments about, about which we know more, about which we know less. Byzantine history, in this sense, is uh, a good example because up to the sixth century we know uh, f fairly um, fairly a lot. Um, while um, essentially during the seventh century we fall into the so-called Byzantine Dark Ages, dark because we uh, they're not well documented. Um, similarly to what happens in the West, there are actually many similarities in this sense. Um, but uh, and and then eventually we come back, especially from 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 the mid of the eighth uh, century onwards, to know more. So relatively to Byzantine cataphracts, we tend to divide the um, essentially two types of cataphracts that are. Which is definitely good from a, from a conceptual point of view, because indeed uh, we have evidence of um, cataphracts in the uh, Roman armed forces since the late antique uh, Roman times. Um, then we basically, s um, which were conceived in in a, in a particular fashion, mostly heavy cavalry for shock power, but not as strong as the um, 
and effective, especially as the later 11th century, let's say, feudal style, pernoia style. And the pernoia was not really a feudal system in theory, but in practice it was something pretty close to it. Which is all another cataphract that appears after many centuries, and that's why I talked about the so-called Nicophorian cataphracts in my, in my other video, because those were essentially the uh, the typology that uh, take their name from the time of Nicaf the Emperor Nicephorus, who was one of the greatest generals of his times, uh, uh, not just um, uh, the ruler of the Byzantine Empire. Um, which seemingly re revived um, this this cataphract tradition, and uh, and eventually we have a pretty good, um, extensive knowledge of of uh, cataphract use during the Comnenian age, um, up to the 12th century. Then we um, we generally say that cataphracts disappear from from the Byzantine army because we have no evidence anymore, especially after the 12th century and the uh, the destruction of the Byzantine Empire in 1204, uh, when um, the world, you know, the, the Byzantine Empire lived on in the sense because eventually Constantinople was reconquered by the Byzantines to the Crusade um, from the uh, the, the Latin Empire that had been esta established by the Westerners in there, but let's say that um, th that strong statal tradition that the Empire had maintained uh, up to that point went destroyed, and together with it also part of its um, recruitment system and part of its military traditions in turn, so that the later Byzantine army is something uh, relatively closer to the Western armies, in, in uh, conceptually speaking, in terms of recruitment, equipment, and all. There were al there were also lots of Westerners. Um, the the late, uh, you know, the Byzantine army that fought um, against the Ottomans was essentially a Renaissance army, like similarly the, the ones of the West. They bought, I don't know, Italian armor. They had. Um, knights coming from, I don't know, France, England, I mean, everywhere, uh, from Western Europe, and they, um, so we generally say that the cataphract basically stands only in these two times of Byzantine history. My opinion is relatively different, because first of all, we have to um, clearly understand what a cataphract uh, de facto is, because also in here the term has nothing um, um, you know, categorical attached to it. In Greek, cataphract means simply armored, and in fact we have actually lots of difficulties from sources to understand um, what a cataphract really was, because if you find written cataphract, I mean if you have an iconographic evidence, like you see a ca um, you know, on a um, a cavalryman equipped with heavy armor, maybe for him and as well as for the horse, you can say, oh look, that's so heavily um, armored, so that's a cataphract. And that's fine, because by approximation that's what, iconically at least, we consider as a, f a cataphract. But a cataphract could be really anything that had armor on, uh, including partial armor. Um, there were cataphracts that, uh, in this sense, and we don't really know, I mean, I, I don't think there is a source. By the way, in, in the later, um, in the 11th century, we definitely have evidence of a sort of tripartition of the cavalry categories, from which we find the cataphract, that is like the elite heavy cavalrymen, often with a he very heavy armor, even for the horse. Um, um, then the so-called cursores, wi which is a Latin term that was still even, I think, used uh, maybe in an Hellenized form in the Byzantine army, that were instead uh, a much more multi-role uh, cavalry. Um, often, you know, you, you might be thinking that with these were runners, because that's what cursor actually means. Um, but they could be equipped even heavily. Uh, even as, you know, there was a, a pretty wide range of, uh, in terms of degree of um, 
uh, armor protection for the courser, I believe. Uh, some sources describe them as runners, so as guys that had to be mostly lightly armored. Others uh, essentially depict him as uh, a mm, heavily armored at the point of its uh, western counterpart, the knight of the time, like an Antonian knight. Um, and then there was the horse archers, um, uh, the horse archer that uh, was definitely a runner. It was still a cape for melee combat in some fashion because they had weaponry of some kind, like swords and, and all, but they were chiefly skirmishers in this sense. Um, and those were the lighter category. Although we have evidence even of cataphract horse archers. So what you immediately understand is that in this mess, even though certain prescriptions were issued for having uh, this, this or that kind of, of armor, which is something that we start having back from Nicophorian times, um, as I discussed in that video, um, we still can't be categorical about what a cataphract really was in practice, especially relatively to the um, I, in my opinion, to the horse armor, which makes a, a huge deal of difference, because one thing is being an armored knight and having um, a degree, you know, uh, heaviness, even for the horse, that if anything stands below uh, un un under you. Um, but it, it makes a, a huge difference in, in, in uh, material, economical, <coughs> In energetic terms, in, I don't know how you want to say that, for the horse would be fully equipped. So certain uh, knights, like the one you see here, for instance, are um, certain cataphracts, so we're calling this way because they were heavy, but they didn't have, however, the full um, metal horse armor. Here, I think the depiction represents a padded coat um, that I don't remember how it was called in Greek, uh, at the time, but um, it was something pretty common uh, as a as a let's say one point zero form of uh, protection. Because by the way, um, you don't need to wear this padded coat necessarily under the um, uh, the the armor. Uh, some of these were actually worn over the armor, as well as underneath. Others were um, actually worn alone. Like, um, you might say, what, what's the point? Well, because this very thick padded coat could arrive to like seemingly five centimeters of very thick tissue, um, was in itself enough to deflect certain mm, blows that didn't arrive straight at 90 degrees on you, and they were still pretty effective. Some of them were covered in silk. Silk is extremely res resistant. It's still used for um, for certain type of um, bullet stopping um, armor today. Um, if you look into medieval Japan, you see that the the the, the Japanese uh, knights had um, this um, large uh, sacks of silk uh, behind their backs. That when the horse ran, basically they uh, they filled themselves with air, and therefore they expanded over uh, behind the um, the knights. Um, um, back and um, they could stop um, um, uh, bullets arriving and, and hits. So there were lots of tricks that really didn't involve um, metal armor, but they were mm, conceived as a heavier protection and all. Uh, I don't remember which point I was making now with the padded coat, but oh yes, for the idea that the the cataphract could, could be also something relatively lighter than the fully uh, knight and horse uh, armored um, duo, let's say. And that there are actually many differences, uh, and, and as well as many differences for the um, relatively to the, the actual equipment of these um, knights that could vary really in great degree. So what I wanted <laughs> really to say, even though I, I don't think whether how much it is correct, maybe the most expert of you will be able to, to answer me to this, relatively to this, but in this sense the differentiation with finding Nikephorian times actually could, could conceal the uh, a much more mm, stratified differentiation of kinds of cataphracts. Mm. 
um, in the in usage. This comes from from many uh, I think logical points. First of all, yes, uh, it is true you have to have an elite uh, trooper uh, at a certain point. The Byzantine Empire fought uh, throughout all the early Middle Ages. Um, and beyond against uh, peoples that were um, mostly um, horse riders. The Byzantine Empire had this kind of pontic um, characterization, especially after the loss of uh, the Near East to, to, to the um, Muslims. Um, and it, it suffered actually the, the assault of many steppes peoples during this time. So I, my idea is that even if there was no evidence to, mm, there is no evidence to say uh, at this point the, the Byzantines had heavy cataphracts, I think that given the uh, relatively, uh, the relative fall in standardization, in, in the decline of the Byzantine state, the contraction, the shrinking of its borders and to access to resources, the Byzantines still fielded cataphracts throughout all the early Middle Ages. Well, during Nikephorian times, there was a revival, not a reintroduction, which was aimed at having not really that kind of trooper um, um, from from nothingness. I mean, it's not that previously to Nikephorus that there, there weren't heavy cataphracts, um, but that they could be more easily accessible uh, in terms of pool of recruitment. Because that's really the point, the availability of these troops, which is not just a um, material availability, but also a, a way to control their recruitment. Because very heavy cavalrymen are effective only if they fight in formations. Yes, as individual fighters they're pretty uh, amazing on their own, but they are elite, and the elite uh, on the field is something that you use only in very desperate situations. In um, in a condition in which you have this terrible shock power that has to arrive often towards the end of the battle when the enemy uh, and also your units uh, are wary, um, that has to to actually do a very quick action because um, very heavy units um, tire themselves very very soon. So you have to address them mm, to the enemy with a certain degree of mm, even a s of certainty of what the maneuver is going to be because these guys can. Uh, sometimes are, are even so heavy that they can't even maneuver practically. Uh, most of the lead cataphracts, as we know, were basically sent against the enemy uh, straight ahead without any further maneuvering because that would have been uh, even mm, uh, detrimental to the um, com compactness of their formation and all. Um, but aside this, aside from the very um, diamond uh, point, let's say, of the army, um, there were surely other forms of heavy cavalry that can perfectly fit into the cataphractoi in, in, um, in, you know, theoretic, in conceptual standards. Uh, that, however, um, were there and had a lighter degree of equipment. Uh, uh, without any mm, further special differentiation. Mm. Uh, the Byzantine Empire at the time was growing something increasingly more private. That title administration was actually being st substituted by the uh, control that the Byzantine aristocratic, uh, the, the fewer and, and wealthier aristocratic um, Byzantine families had on society. Um, they had huge estates, they could provide on their own, privately, um, even the equipment, they could train on their own. Um, so, uh, it, it's kind of silly to think, in my opinion, that um, in this sense that there was not, um, 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 let's say, a pool of heavy cavalrymen in, into the Byzantine world that um, could be armed just like the Westerners in the most diverse fashions, in spite of a certain, you know, functional uh, mm, standard, uh, we can s uh, call it this way, aside from what the saddle machine could produce, because the saddle machine was really transforming into a sort of um, semi-feudal uh, system at this time in the Empire. 
So relatively to the equipment, and that's why I came to the equipment, because I wanted to stress the relative heterogeneity of the equipment you could find in Byzantine cataphract this time. Um, we have um, actually um, enough evidence. The problem with the Byzantine, um, um, we, we mostly rely on Byzantine uh, iconographical sources. There are certain archaeological finds as well. Um, that really tells us a lot, and I'm not gonna enter now in detail the single things. I might do it one day, but um, it's kind of even boring because it basically tells you. I mean, at least for me, I, I don't care to know every single how, how every single um, strap was attached and all. But the uh, also because in this sense, it doesn't make sense to 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 categorize because every knight could literally wear in a, in a different fashion. Uh, okay, there was definitely a certain kind of equipment, but everything could vary. Mm. It w they were all manufacturers no industrial m m machinery production. So everybody could really wear... Uh, it's important to stress the evidence that we have, but we still... Uh, it's probably even more important to stress that that, that is not all. Mm -hmm. So we have all the different type of um, armor, of corselets. Uh, this could vary really um, from uh, lamellar um, and the so-called um, uh, I don't know, I don't remember how you say that uh, in English, but the kind of fish skin um, um, kind of, uh, the scale armor. Uh, the, the, well, scale armor is what I was telling about. Uh, okay, let's say, let's differentiate between lamellar armor and scale armor. Male um, um, and even plate armor, probably, because uh, even though plate armor is something that you find later in time in European European equipment, definitely, as we were saying before, the Byzantine equipment had um, probably mm, st very strong influences from the steppes, and the worst uh, steppes peoples that, that dwelled relatively close to the empire that were using lamellar armors, but also partly a full mm, sort of plate armor mm, uh, that wasn't as sophisticated as the one that eventually came in at from, from the mid of the 13th century that was much more um, uh, modulated. I mean, the, the, the ancient, it, the, even in the ancient world, there, there was plate armor, actually, um, in the, especially in these steps, people. So, really, the, the, the degree of influence in uh, in the uh, Byzantine military equipment is something incre it was something incredible at this time and we have to think that probably every place of the empire where these troops were mm, drawn from definitely uh, resented of certain uh, local influences in spite of the general um, issues standardiz uh, issued standardizations mm from the imperial uh, ad military administration. Um, so there are many, obviously, characteristics compared to... Usually the armor was worn definitely for the chest, for this torso. The helmets could relatively vary, um, too. Um, usually we have this um, conic form that seems to be particularly widespread into the uh, the Byzantine army of this time, so there are many manuscripts that actually show this. Um, we there, there were probably also this guy here in the background picture is wearing also an oven tail that was something um, definitely useful for facial protection um, because um, all the face was covered in mail and just the eyes were left, uh, the eye slits um, were were left uh, open. Um, that was something that could give problems for breeding, so this actually stresses the fact that um, 
well, actually with mail you can easily breathe, but it, it's not really as if you had enough in front of your face. So the idea is that the more you're covered in general, the more you, you're fatigued, the more you need to, to breathe um, consistently. And that's the reason why you, we think also in part that the cataphracts simply couldn't make it to, to do extremely complex maneuver because they would run out of steam and they would become useless for all the the effort that that it made to to you know just to field them um <laughs> relatively to the shields um what I find interesting is that there is um a, a certain degree of variety um the um um there were actually very strong solid um um round shields pretty heavy ones that could really vary in size from let's say 75 to to 1 meter of diameter which is not really a few consider also that people at the time were on average shorter than what we are today because they didn't have a great nutrition even if they were nobles they, they still had um, they were s still kind of smaller guys so this mm, this very big shield is something very interesting because um, it it usually doesn't fit with an extra it, uh, at least there is this prejudice that very um, heavy large uh, metal shields do not fit into uh, the um, the rank of com of mm, dynamic fencing shields. Actually, this is a bit uh, an exaggeration. First of all, these guys were um, very highly trained, so they definitely knew how to use these these shields into combat. They were probably even much stronger than us. I mean, the modern reenactors, surely some of them are pretty fit people, but. Um, they don't necessarily train um, every day in the fashion these guys did. So even certain muscles that maybe you, you used uh, for, uh, for instance, it, it's evident for from, from from the guys that do um, uh, oplitic uh, reenactment that uh, the, the many of them say, well, the underarm grip is kind of more functional. I I I make less fatigue. I I. I tire um, much less if I use the underarm grip. Well, that's because usually they don't have the uh, the muscles uh, <laughs> for um, for using the overarm grip that was actually the, the most used uh, into the oplitic warfare because they haven't trained enough to use that kind of uh, of muscles that are are good for overarm that are functional for overarm um, grip fighting. Um, so we have to think that these guys lived also a, di a very different life from ours that involved mm, a much greater physical uh, dynamicity um, in, in, in a certain fashion so that um, certain forts weren't really felt as um, so unnatural or as uh, difficult to do. Um, however, these very big round shields were also seemingly pretty heavy um, and for this reason, um, these are certain characteristics that you can't even just understand uh, at a quick glance. Um, they were attached with a shoulder strap, the same that the uh, knights um, in the West were, were, you know, the Frankish knights were, uh, were keeping themselves to, and which is called a guige in, in French, which actually helps to to hold the the shield to your shoulder so that basically in certain occasions you're not even actually um, 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 holding the ship with uh, the shields uh, the shield with your arm, with your hands but you just um, basically let the shield falling on on your arm being hanged by the shoulder strap this can be very useful especially for for heavy cavalry, for one very simple reason, uh, that is the fact that you can use your um, both hands for the uh, lance uh, fencing, uh, especially during a cavalry charge, because um, 
uh, first of all you, you should be able to direct the horse and therefore uh, holding at the reins uh, which is something that in many ways you, you can do. There is a lot of debate historically speaking how um, especially the steps people could practically remain on, on fixed on horseback by using the, the double hand contos uh, lengths that was incidentally still used by uh, even by the Byzantines at this time in their cavalry. Um, uh, in fact, without even um, uh, holding the reins, um, and one of the reasons is that the, the war horses were trained actually to even obey pretty quickly to the knight just with a certain M quick m muscular move or uh, just um, you know um, a vocal order. They were ex excellent uh, horse breeds um, that were that had been selected exactly for for that among uh, other mm, among other characteristics. Um, and therefore, we think that it was a very complicated system of of straps and and belts that basically kept these guys attached to the uh, to the horse. Um, and incidentally the shield was attached with, with a shoulder strap. So the idea is that basically the tactical function of the cataracts was so elitary that these guys were just meant uh, and, and, and they had maximized their equipment and tactics just to, to charge straight ahead against the enemy with this um, with this lance in their hands and sh for shock power and all, so really having this very big shield um, on your um, if you are if you use your right, um, uh, uh, you it's going to be on your left, um, and w therefore protecting uh, a vital part of your of your body that is the neck and chest. Um, and, and and not worrying about it being there. It's it's it's, it's as if having a very big um, extra armor over your um, your torso armor. Uh, I shouldn't personally uh, emphasize to you very much this usage because definitely these big shields were also used quite dynamically with a hand grip. So um, there's nothing surprising in it. Um, um, the some of these cataracts were so heavily armored that actually their armor was enough to keep the shield um, to not to even wear the shield in a certain fashion. If you look at, for instance, late medieval European um, knights, you see that basically the shield gets even always increasingly smaller, and some uh, at a certain point it even doesn't appear anymore. If not something as that just um, it was just needed for um, deflecting um, the enemy hits, but just with a, as a very small device. The, um, the shield, however, was still dynamically used, so you could either attach to the guiche or simply using it uh, as well in a dynamic fight. Um, um, and that was quite important. There were also, however, other types of uh, shield, including the kite, so-called kite shield, that um, could... there is a lot of debate on kite shields, where they originated and how, especially which kind of um, um, relation there is between the development of kite shields, especially for the most iconic Norman cavalry, uh, that at this time, incidentally, in the 11th century, had a very strong um, closeness to the Byzantine Empire, because the Normans went as mercenaries in the Byzantine Empire, they fought into the Mediterranean, um, they, and they started adopting this shield. Um, in my opinion, uh, certain armor, uh, s certain equip armaments can actually develop um, in same, more or less, at the same times for um, uh, autonomously in certain different regions. Still, um, it, it it would be blind not to consider the uh, the very strict, um, the very strong connections that existed between.
between the Europeans at this point, between uh, Northern and Southern Europe in, in military affairs, chiefly also thanks to the Normans that literally uh, fought everywhere this time into, especially not maybe just in Central Europe, really not, but all around where, where there was sea, essentially, they, they could seal their um, sail there, sorry, and, uh, and go fight in, in there. So many people say that, um, sometimes I find written that the kite shield might have been adopted by the Byzantines from the Westerners, but if anything, I, I knew that it was the other way around. If there, w if, if, such, uh, if there has necessarily to be a relation of filiation, let's say, um, there is a Byzantine manuscript um, of the 10th century that there is, there is a triangled shield that could be the progenitor actually of the Norman kite or, or drop shaped uh, shield. Um, but the truth is that the, the, the Norman kite um, slash drop shield um, was probably more derived uh, from the round shield. Uh, very few people know this, but actually if you follow the design um, the the drop shield is actually um, uh, an ob mm, I don't know um, how, how to say that a an oblong let's say an oblongization <laughs> let, let's coniate this uh, this new term of the round Viking or migration era shield because uh, these things happened autonomously as well. And the uh, and the first representation of the Norman shield, however, are in the Codex Aureus of Echternach, if I'm not wrong, um, which is a beautiful Ottonian um, uh, illuminated manuscript and a Catalan Bible. Yes, a Catalan a Spanish Bible. It should be the Biblia Sancti Petri Rodensis in Latin, which um, that existed before the first half of the uh, 11th century. Mm. So even a little before Bayeux. And in this document, the Norman shield is perfectly recognizable both in the infantry and the cavalry, which is very important because this wasn't just a cavalry shield. Al although, we must say that those can kind of, well, it's a bit complicated. Say that, however, knights at this time still dismounted pretty often. So that sometimes the infantry that you see, especially if it's heavily cursed, is basically the same. Uh, cavalry, dismounted cavalry uh, often. I don't know how much this uh, happened into the Byzantine Empire, because the Byzantine Empire had a more um, um, probably, um, this is just a speculation, but let's say the Byzantine Empire had a more orderly um, society than let's say the Norman one. I mean Norman society has an endemic warfare. The Byzantine has had too, but mostly against external enemies. There were surely a, a, a big number of civil wars during these times in Byzantine history and a lot of infighting into the Byzantine territories, so we don't have to stress this too much, and it's probably a, a wrong interpretation. But let's say that uh, at least um, relatively to the um, heavier um, elite that was usually fielded by the imperial forces for big battles and all. Um, this um, um, uh, the, the probably the Byzantine, that specific type of Byzantine cavalry dismounted less frequently than the Norman cavalry. It's pretty forced to say something like that, but let's say that the Byzantines at this time were pretty um, uh, on the lead, let's say, on, on military technology, and they could, at least in certain tactical conditions, field troops that maybe could really fight in any kind of situation, but that maybe for that specific role were equipped functionally just to do this very only horse uh, back uh, fighting in practice. Uh, which doesn't make sense because at every clash most of these guys would get uh, thrown on, on the ground during the charges and all and they obviously needed to still fight on foot and they did probably many other occasions but that wasn't really the ideal condition while 
the average Norman Knight is a bit less loaded it's a, a, on average compared to the very elite of the Byzantine force but as I was saying before there were probably lots of, of other Byzantine uh, heavy cavalrymen that in this sense perfectly fit with and that were the majority in my opinion that perfectly fitted with the same standards of the Norman cavalry as for every cavalry that existed in Europe in heavy terms at the time at least in terms of individual equipment then the collective uh, um, and individual training then the collective training is another matter because that mostly spread together with uh, feudalism although probably the Byzantine uh, style structures were able to through the pronoia and a certain degree of centralization to uh, issue a, uh, uh, effectively a pretty um, good collective training, uh, good level of collective training to, to these troops, even if they were in a fully feudal uh, society uh, uh, in, in practice. So probably um, I'm falling to the trick of categorizing myself <laughs> into this video. So just um, stay open, just imagine the whole thing in a very fluid, fluid, fluid way. But relatively to the shields, however, we, we the, the Byzantine shields, I, I think that the Byzantines were developing it by themselves, probably on the base of some... Uh, there were surely other peoples that used that, especially in the, I think, in the Near East. Um, we have a very few evidence of this, so we, we, have, we can make only a hypothesis. But usually the Byzantine... Um, type shield is is slightly different from the um, from the one in the use in in the West at this time because um, let's say that it had a, an almond shape mm, that prevailed in Eastern Europe mm. um, um, uh, even um, beyond uh, the um, the um, you know the, the the usage of the kite shield in the West, so it was probably a kind of um, of shield that really developed partly on on a local base, and that probably there are relations between the East and West that influence each other pretty pretty consistently. I'm sure, but um, uh, there's still relatively um, uh, certain relative differences. Why is that? I don't really know. One of the speculations I, wa uh, I was making, th very theoretically, is that the um, the Norman kite shield is. Um, wait, I, I'm, I'm keeping saying Norman, but it's really Frankish because, yes, the Normans used it, but basically it was still also used in in the other Frankish. Um, um, kingdoms uh, uh, at the time, like in France, Germany, Italy, et etc. Um, but the idea is that the kite shield is probably something that looks um, relatively more fitting to, for really a cavalry protection, because usually it's very long at the top and relatively thinner compared to the almond, um, to the almond uh, shaped one. Um, so some of them are were practically um, uh, um, very um, very um, very similar mm -hmm. but the fact that the Western one was more oblong in this sense makes me suggest that it was probably something more fitting for um, for a cavalry defense so having the need of having a relatively thinner shield that can cover or your or your flank um, uh, from shoulder to 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 thigh or even uh, below uh, that definitely still has some use for infantry because we know that infantry is even lighter ones use such type of shield but the almond shaped shield is uh, in the of the east is relatively probably um more fitting for uh i don't know how to say that but it, it it's kind of uh, as if it, it was fit for a more dynamic use mm. i mean the, the kite shield concept I, i'm extremizing here because i'm extremizing the the kite shield from uh, from white side and the almond shaped one 
as if there was nothing in the middle. The, the majority was in the middle, so but taking the two extremes, it's as if the the kite shield was mostly fit for for a static um, usage on cavalry for protecting your your side, your flank, while the almond shield being larger, something that probably has a more dynamic use, maybe. Uh, but here I'm really speculating. Um, and as I was saying, uh, they were really uh, spread in in similar fashions. Um, and it actually goes it, this last interpretation actually goes uh, against even the um, the conceptualization that I made before, because the very elite of the Byzantine force at this point um, might have used um, should have used as a, an essentially cavalry force maybe a more kite shaped shield instead. It kind of use this even round shields as we have seen um, so it, it, it really doesn't make much much difference really and um, but it's likely however that the almond shaped shield was fit for uh, a certain type of cavalry that was also pretty dynamic in dismounting so this suggests that certain Byzantine cataphracts, so-called cataphracts, were also probably lighter more agile than the um, mm, let's say iconical uh, heavy um, uh, ultra heavy force that we imagine and that they were probably more dynamic and could also fight as well on, on foot in, in, as in, in infantry formations and all um the um um there is also evidence of very heavy complete um armor worn without um Oh, by the way, this is the important thing, is that many um, infantry, uh, excuse me, and we come back to the initial point <laughs> in, in many ways, that the s certain cataphracts uh, definitely didn't have armored horses, so sometimes you find very heavily equipped uh, knights with no horse armor, which actually was the normality at the time. Even if you take the westerners, you notice that they uh, they didn't wear horse armor. Um, the reason is that it was extremely expensive, even more than the knight's um, in individual protection. Uh, we have evidence later, like I think in the 11th century, that the Hungarians, probably on this, on the far of this uh, Byzantine influence, did wear a certain kind of uh, armor for horses, but it was partly either a uh, chest armor or a uh, uh, head um, uh, protection, something like that, but actually the majority of um, of, of uh, European cavalry at this point, it doesn't matter how much elite it, it really was, it, it, it didn't use uh, horse armor by large. They could use a padded coat at best, but let's say that the, the horse, um, as costly as it could be, was relatively expandable. There are many people who say, oh well, but you know, it's also because in the age of cavalry, um, in this early age of cavalry, um, the, the nobility tended not to struck much each other horses. Mm, not really much, that it's really an ideal. Um, although, um, uh, there were probably other reasons. Surely, the idea, th th there was a sort of chivalric behavior that contemplated the, the shame of hitting one's horse as a form of cowardice, because the real knight's uh, ideal was to to defeat the, the the enemy knight, not the enemy horse. It's as if uh, uh, there are two uh, motorcycle riders and uh, that have to compete together in a in a uh, motorcycle race, and one of the other. Mm, basically uh, sab sabotages the, the other's uh, guy's motorcycle. <laughs> so that that's really, uh, as, we, uh, as weird as it sounds, that's really the, the concept of fairness that lays behind. But we know that the, the ideals of warfare here were pretty much forgotten <laughs> into actual battles. Um, I must say that, if anything, it was probably the reason of a um, that uh, mm, at least during 
very big clashes. It was re really probably at, at this time more about the 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 whole body of the cavalry than the single horses that that actually mattered. That you couldn't really stop at this time. There, there weren't enough uh, infantries that were strong enough, aside from certain areas of Europe, to stop cavalry. Um, charges in open ground. The crossbow was also relatively uh, mostly in the feudal mm, uh, in feudal Europe and mostly in France because even if you start going into England, into Germany, especially into uh, Italy, there were already infantry that were substantially strong. I say that as feudal the society is and the least there are um, strong infantry. The 11th century is not really the uh, doesn't see the full predominance of cavalry of heavy cavalry on the battlefields, um, but it it was speeding towards that direction. There were a few crossbows. This is I think it's important. There were definitely bows around. Took uh, hasting, hastings and 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 think of the importance of 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 uh, arrows, um, but there wasn't a really a a massive need for a horse protection when a whole block of cavalry acted together. I mean, it was really about the impact force that it could do. They definitely used javelins, even into straight into the feudal age. Still, um, same knights actually, and I. It, it's strange it, that I don't find it, uh, an extremely big evidence of um, javelins for for. Um, Byzantine cataphracts, but I'm pretty sure that they used it as well because that was very conceptually there uh, as a normal thing to do. Um, uh, it, w it wasn't just the Normans who used javelins on, uh, as heavy cavalrymen. Um, but what I'm saying is. Um, that the, the the battlefields of this time were overloaded with deadly projectiles to to need uh, the ultra heavy expense of having an armored horse. So um, at this time, uh, it, it, it's very interesting that compared to Western Europe, that was developing uh, the full feudal cavalry. Still, it was into Eastern Europe that you could find actually full uh, horse armor mm, for a very elite. Uh, usually horse armor seems to appear uh, in the West like for the th in the 13th century as um, in, in full covers of mail usually but it was still a very narrow body of the world cavalry that um, that could afford such an expense and it wasn't conceptually like the uh, cataphract I mean it was something close but really the Byzantines and their Eastern influence from the steppes really brought much more the sense of complete uh, armor, let's say, a full body armor for um, horse and cavalrymen. Um, so, and, and you have in this back background picture definitely the, the idea of what this meant. This guy's probably, this horse is probably not wearing armor under his padded coat. Um, even though it could be possible as well at least for certain, especially for the head protection, I mean even the horse, the first thing you need to protect in in an animal's body, it doesn't matter where, where it's a human or a horse, is his head because that's where the guy's functions from so um, that's your first concern. Even feel the um, the psychology of warfare, just even if you have never been into a fight, just imagine the, the care that you have for your face instinctively for your head before than any other part of your body. You know, the fear that you immediately feel when you are um, in a conditions of danger is protect my head. You immediately feel, you, you sense that your nervous system is checking if everything in, in, on your head's surface is is actually fine and you feel that it's very weak and can be broken from a moment to another so first thing first armor always starts from your head it can be even for the poorest guy maybe just a leather um, coif, coif, I don't know how to say that uh, like a, something you you wear or, or your head um, 
just defend your head first. Um, to conclude, I would like to discuss instead the cavalry lances, since we have mentioned the heavy javelins at this point that were actually lances themselves. Mm -hmm. There is a certain idea that um, even here the, the Byzantines were influenced by the Westerners in, because uh, at this time there is evidence from illustrative sources that there were shorter uh, lances into the Byzantine army. Well, illustrative sources can be fantasy, first of all. As I was saying before, they are too scanty as an evidence. Um, I don't see why the Byzantines should have, uh, should have not used short um, short lances like the Westerners were doing. I mean, what was the cultural factor behind that? I mean, warfare was pretty homogeneous at this time everywhere, so it's not that it takes to be influenced by someone else. These are the, these are the terrible modern mind uh, st um, prejudices that you need to learn from someone else. No, you can learn also by yourself. Uh, and this is what humans did in most of the ages. They might have taken ideas, but the concepts were laying there, you know. Short or long spears have existed in every moment in history um, for for obvious reasons. And relatively to shorter um, lances, this is very interesting because it actually su suggests that some of them could be actually thrown, like javelins. This is what the we know that the heavy cavalry did. Uh, in the West um, for the simple reason that uh, if there is still very th um, thick compact formation of um, spearmen in front of you the horse will not charge into it because the horse stops at everything that he thinks is uh, an obstacle um, and therefore what you could do was before the final charge maybe with lighter uh, cavalry to skirmish the, the shield so throwing javelins at it hoping to, 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 to soften up this, the shield wall and, and then eventually when it was softened enough, uh, up enough to try to, to charge if it was feasible. This is what you see that the Normans did at Hastings. Um, probably were in, in Byzantine, um, in the Byzantine world um, there were similar forms of, of, of infantry that could withstand uh, uh, cavalry charges to a certain point. Um, I'm pretty sure in the Near East there, there were, but already city militias and stuff like that, or just uh, just foot knights that could do the, the very same thing. So uh, even in here, no need for categorization. East and West were pretty similar. Um, the um, the uh, the idea is that people said oh, there is a Western influence because there were Western mercenaries uh, being used by the Byzantines at this time. Yeah, okay, but, uh, you know, that's not a, a proof, that's not a, you know, the Byzantines might still have had perfectly different types of, uh, of lances. So the, um, the, really the main cavalry lance was the uh, 12 foot contus or contarion as it was called. It was a pretty ancient weapon that the uh, actually the, the Greeks knew since the times of uh, into which they fought against the Sarmatians or the Sh uh, or the Shitsians. I mean the the Shitsians are not so famous for the contus but they they surely used it uh, as well. The Sarmatians are most f mostly famous for the contest because they had heavily um, armored cavalrymen that were used to for mainly for shock power, and this is what the Byzantines, uh, Byzantine cataphracts were. So uh, you see that even in two different periods of history, eventually weapons change a very few. And there is evidence of the contest being used by the Byzantine cataphracts up well to the mid 11th century. Mm -hmm. Um, Anna Komnena actually uh, writes that it was still in use in, in 1140. Mm. Uh, but my opinion is that this kind of lances um, still existed throughout all the um, at least the 12th century, and that eventually, just with the collapse of the empire and the mm, basically mm, 
the basic collapse of availability of um, of such um, of heavy cataphracts because of the collapse of this of the Byzantine style machine and uh, general you know it wasn't much about the style machine but really the, the amount of the sheer amount of lands that the empire had owned before that eventually it, after the before the crusades it shrank to something much smaller they they usually uh, hired um, uh, western knights that even settled into place like uh, Turkey or as uh, mm, as vassals uh, of the Komnenians. Uh, relatively to the debate underarm over arm uh, couche um, grip let's say or way of using the the lengths uh, there is it's been suggested that by the late tenth century the um from from i think here also from iconographic sources the uh, the lengths was usually uh coached under harm mm -hmm. and you can see that in many mask many famous manuscripts including the famous uh Shilitsa's one that if you google uh, you the uh, Byzantine cataphract is the f usually the first pictures that will appear uh, are about this kind of golden looking knights that uh, Byzantine cataphracts that old indeed the contas with the couche on their arm um, legs. Um, uh, there are uh, there is even obviously evidence that the uh, legs could be used both over and under arm like in any other time of history. This is another modernistic stupid prejudice that, I don't know, at a certain point guys stopped using lances in a certain way and the lance is a lance. You can use it in the in in all ways you wish. <laughs> this is what knights did in all times in history. You know, it's not that during the full feudalism age the lance was exclusively used in couche uh, underarm. It was used with, in every kind of way underarm, overarm, prone. Uh, this is the standard. Then there was a general, let's say, doctrinal use for which if you are charging in, in compact formations of, uh, of cavalrymen, you need, uh, I mean, to, to maximize the charge impact using the, uh, the lance uh, couché underarm is, is a pretty effective way to, to, to maximize damage. And this is very interesting because um, this is something that um, you see that the Byzantines were already doing. So this stresses the obvious nature of this heavy cavalry as a shock power. Um, and I'm saying this because in, dur during the early, I mean, there is a huge historiographical debate whether uh, when uh, into Western cavalries the, um, say, the the knights, the cavalrymen started to use the couche on their arm uh, grip, let's say, because it's usually associated to the rise of feudalism. While in the migration era, cavalrymen were pretty good. Cavalrymen were pretty good individually, but they didn't have enough collective training and not enough uh, individual resources as few as as lords, like instead would happen into the feudal age. To, to feel this um, body of very heavy collectively trained uh, cavalry. So I it's probably an overly emphasized problem um, um, and definitely the evidence that we have mm, um, it's not enough. We have to use logics even in here. But definitely when you start to see that into a certain phase of the Middle Ages the couche underarm um, Langs uh, appears into massively or regularly into the uh, into the sources. That's probably a very good indicator that that cavalry was something very heavy. It probably had a sort of feudal background, like it could be the, the Frankish one in the West and the Pernoia system in the Byzantine Empire. And that that was probably the um, the uh, that was that that was the elite cavalry. Uh, of the situation, say so. Um, it's kind of interesting. It's very important, and uh, it has to be considered. But never fall into the mistake that uh, 
you know, it was a standardized ways how to use a lance because especially when you are in combat, um, you're not even caring because of all the shock, the adrenaline, the, the blood pumping like hell into your veins. How even what you have in your hands, you know, everything does if you want to really kill someone. Uh, this is brutally what happens in warfare. Um, and you, um, there would be much to add to this. Uh, I don't know how well I talked about this topic because I repeat, uh, the really the Byzantine equipment at this time, is, uh, the Byzantine armaments at this time is pretty well documented, so um, I could have said much more to do, uh, I, I might have done something way more researched, but I, I think it's more important to just give certain, mm, a bit of food for toth, really, because that's all I, mostly what I care about, instead of making a list of all how that piece of of armor was sewn to, to the other piece and the pad, how the padded was, uh, thing was, was worn. Yeah, it can be interesting, but it's not all about for, for understanding the, the combat, which I, I'm mostly fascinated by. So, um, I hope that you enjoyed this video, and if you did, please share it, otherwise uh, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you want to receive further news about my new contents. For now, as always, I thank you heartily for watching, I wish you a nice time, and see you next time. Bye!